Welcome to the State of Developer Education Season 2, brought to you by Major League Hacking. We bring together panels of experts on developer education, developer relations, and developer advocacy to talk about the best practices in a variety of topics so that you can improve how your business is working with developer communities. Whether you're a DevRel leader, an advocate, or a community builder, you're in the right place to explore innovative approaches to learning and development in technology. I'm John Gottfried, co-founder of Major League Hacking, and I'll be guiding you through this episode's discussion. Prepare to connect, engage, and transform the way we think about developer education. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the State of Developer Education Season 2. Uh, our panel for April 2024 is about developer docs and content. And we have a fantastic group of panelists here uh, with experience building docs and content at a wide variety of companies. Uh, I'm really excited to hear everything they have to say uh, and share some tips and best practices for you to improve your own docs and content strategy and create an excellent experience for your developer community. Uh, let's start off with a quick intro from each of the panelists, and then we will dive right into questions. Uh, Jen, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, so I'm Jen Lever, and I lead the developer education team at Twilio right now. So I've been here for a couple of years. Uh, before that, I led the documentation team at GitHub, um, where I started as a, a writer on the team there. And before that, I've just basically been a technical writer my entire career. So um, all I've ever known is documentation. Um, got into the developer space when I joined GitHub though, and that's kind of where I've I found my calling, I guess, and I uh, just have really enjoyed writing for the developer audience. So that is uh, my backstory. And yeah, happy to be here today. Two companies with fantastic documentation. So I think we have you to thank for that. Oh, no, the team, <laughs> not me. <laughs> Uh, Lorna, you want to go next? <clears throat> Hi, I'm Lorna. I'm based in the UK. I live uh, in the north of England, so like living in the UK, not living in London. I hope that's not too strange for anybody. I lead developer experience at Redocly, which includes uh, documentation. And although I've had a, quite a long career as a software engineer, I've written more docs than the average software engineer. Um, I have a thousand posts on my blog. I've written some books. Describe myself as an engineer with a writing problem. Um, so after a few years in DevRel, that's given me the opportunity to sort of bring engineering and writing together. And I've worked on the documentation projects. Uh, I, I mean, I own them at Redocly and also previously at Ivan. Um, and I worked on the Vonage docs when I worked there as well. So this is like my happy place of taking a technical thing and helping people be successful with it. Love it. And uh, last but not least, Andrew. Hi, everyone. My name is Andrew Jang. I am a software engineer based in Brooklyn, uh, working at Fern, which is a uh, early stage startup uh, building both SDK generation and docs generation tools. Um, and our bread and butter is uh, taking open API specs and turning them into beautiful documentation. And the bar that we try to hold uh, is getting people uh, spun up with Stripe-like documentation with as little effort as possible. I've only been in this role for five months, um, and my previous role was a, a forward deployment engineer at Palantir. And so I am the newest and the most novice uh, in this room when it comes to docs, um, but I have a few thoughts. So I'm very happy to, hear, uh, to be here and to talk to everyone here. Fantastic. I, I love the example of Stripe-like docs. It's kind of a, a good uh, emotional touchstone for developers, maybe. So I'd love to start off the question uh, with sort of a broad overview here of your philosophy. Um, obviously, like you've all mentioned some organizations that are known for having exceptional documentation. What are some of the like core guiding principles that each of you, uh, you know, hold yourselves and your teams to when you're thinking about docs and content at your organizations? I, I think for me, it's uh, it's really about like meeting the users where they are in their journey. That's really kind of when I go back to these like mission statements that I've I've uh, worked on at different companies, it is always about like, like finding the right um, moment for the developer and making sure they have content um, for whatever they're trying to do, basically. So that's the mission statements always kind of kind of align around something with that. Um, but it is about like, okay. 
a developer comes and they say, what, what am I doing? What can I do with this? You want to provide content at that moment when they're like, oh, I, I'm interested. I want to build something. Well, they need a different kind of content in that next moment. So it is really about like understanding all of those kind of touch points throughout the developer journey and just making sure that they have content um, along the way so that they don't feel frustrated, so they don't give up and, and leave your product. So that's kind of the, the mission that we have is just like enabling people, making sure they're supported during all of their work. Of course, there's a lot more that goes into it, but that's kind of the, the overview of how we think about it. Yeah, I would definitely echo that. I think thinking about who you're writing for, and especially if it's within one documentation platform, you've got multiple audiences, that can be quite a challenge. Um, I redocly do uh, developer portals, API documentation. So we have everybody from like super, you know, we have 800 microservices to what's an API again. Um, and so trying to find ways to not just create that documentation, but then also how to signpost people to what they need right now. And do you know about this thing? Are you learning something? Oh, here's an explanation of it. Do you already know how to do it? And you came for the commands to copy and paste? Okay, well, so then we have something that's a bit more like step-based um, and trying to help people to both know that that exists and, and expect it from us, but also find it. <laughs> <laughs> in their moment, um, because a lot of that content can be overlapping. So that's a challenge. I think from um, my point of view, um, having been in organizations where writing docs in the first place is a challenge, um, getting our engineers to be able to generate any sort of documentation is better than having none at all. And so we prioritize creating tools around auto-generating uh, documentation that is up to date. And our customers, customers, which are uh, docs readers, want to be able to go to their doc sites and copy paste functional code. Uh, that's like, I guess, the bare minimum of having good documentation is having accurate code snippets that you can take and uh, paste into VS Code or some compiler and be able to run with that information and start exploring the API or start exploring the SDK product on your own as a developer. And once you hit a point where things stop working, that's when developers get really frustrated. And we've heard of customers who like ended deals. Uh, maybe that's a little dramatic, but we've heard of a couple scenarios of that where they can't trust the the product because they can't trust the documentation. I mean, I've I've certainly churned from using a particular API because I ran into a. Uh, unresolvable problem in the docs, right? I think that's actually a common experience for a lot of developers. But one of the things you touched on though, is like this idea of getting engineers to, you know, like leave comments and write docs. Um, and, and I'd love to hear from our panelists, like who owns what part of that, right? Like are engineers responsible for self-documenting, you know, in like an open API spec or something? in a way that can be generated? Is it up to a content and like technical writing team to translate at that into good docs? Like how do you actually approach the distribution of responsibilities for docs, comments, and then maybe like the, the user facing part of that? So I've had this experience in a, in a bunch of places, um, particularly because I haven't worked very many places that really had dedicated writers at all. Um, so you're doing it with hopefully enthusiastic bystanders, sometimes less enthusiastic bystanders, but you have like other people who are not um, really inside the documentarian discipline. And neither am I really. I always tell people I'm not a writer. Um, and the, the tactics that I've taken for that is to, a bit like open source contributions, always say thank you. Um, this stuff isn't hard. Um, and to try to make sure that there are templates and guidelines and really clear review guidelines and... You know, I've run office hours to bring in new contributors and stuff like that in the past. Um, this is very much about company culture, though. If you if you have a company culture that is like customer fanatical, everybody will try, and you're very unlikely to have lots of problems with secret product features <laughs> that you didn't need to build because no one can use them anyway. Whereas in a company which only values code, that's much more difficult, and it's something that I'm not sure I've really cracked that one yet. I'd agree with all of that that you just said. Um, it's it's a shared responsibility, I'd say too, because um, it's definitely up to I'd say like developers and engineers to really be able to provide that information. But it's up to if you have a dedicated technical writing team, or in our case, a developer education team, 
to be able to take that information and curate it um, in, in a way that makes sense. And I feel like that's kind of where, to me, developer education is going in a lot of ways is is taking um, information provided uh, either th- like from developers or or in a different way, being able to curate a, a different experience um, for folks. But um, I'd also say to me, uh, the docs are kind of a responsibility of everyone at the company, which <laughs> maybe is like uh, me like trying to pass off my responsibilities to people. But um, part of this is like these teams are so small to Lorna's point. It's uh it, you know, like for for instance, right now in Twilio, we only have five folks creating all the content um, for most of our communication-based products, which is like not enough. Um, so what are we going to do here? And yeah, we definitely rely on uh, engineers being able to provide a lot of information, like all of our error code documentation. Um, those folks, are that, that's coming from engineers. Um, that's not coming from us. But at the end of the day, we need like help from product managers to create content. We need um, engineers to jump in and create content. We need folks from support. We need marketing. We need all of these people to align on, you know, what we're telling customers, um, what the the usefulness of features or new products are, all of these things. So I think that's going back a little bit to like what Andrew was talking about too, just in terms of like platform, which is we need tooling that people can use, that everyone can use because having something like, you know, just writing something in a Google Doc and publishing it on a CMS is just not not the way to get people to contribute to the documentation. So, you know, having things that feel comfortable for folks, uh, having a docs as code environment, um, you know, really being able to contribute in interesting ways and saying like, you know, we have a culture of documentation. Like we mentioned Stripe earlier in the, the, the conversation. It's because they have a culture of documentation at the company. That's why they're so successful. So if you can cultivate that cu- that culture, and have the tooling in place, you will have a better product. You will have developers um, really love what you're doing in the documentation. But if you don't, um, you're just going to be kind of working to get there and working against things. Yeah, I I love that perspective. Um, One thing I'd be curious about, Jen, you know, you mentioned like docs as code. And, you know, I know we've been talking a little bit about generative docs. So I want to dig into that a little later. But, you know, Twilio is also known for having a lot of really fantastic like tutorials and quick starts and blog posts. And, you know, I worked at Twilio, I mean, at this point more than a decade ago. And I remember like one of my first tasks on the job was like going through all of these old WordPress posts and updating them to a current version of the SDK, which like, I'm sure you have a better process now, but I'm curious, like how you think about content more holistically than just generating the docs, right? Like, like where do all of these other learning resources uh, fit into that picture? I'll tell you a little bit of a secret here amongst all of our friends on this podcast right now, which is that we actually didn't have a better process up until um, now, basically. So when I was saying like, oh, you know, it's not great to write in a Google Doc and put it in a CMS, that was our process up until like this year. We're actually just finishing up a Docs code migration to get us onto a new platform so that we can do these things. We do use open uh, API for like our, our um, API documentation, but just in terms of like understanding um, across like all of our content, um, we're really lucky because we have a larger team. So I mentioned my team is like fairly small. I do own the, the engineering team as well that um, does our Docs platform and our Docs site. But we were part of a larger part of an organization called the Developer Network at Twilio, which is kind of, uh, if you're in the DevRel space, you you may have heard of it because it, it just works really well. And they've got a great history of um, being able to really bring excitement and playfulness into developer relations. But there's a lot of different teams within there that create different types of content. So create blog posts, create videos, all of these things. So we all have kind of different responsibilities. My team really is just the documentation at this point. Um, and together, we're really trying to, to understand like what are those moments um, that we can capitalize on. So if there's something interesting happening in the industry right now, which is like right now it's, it's all AI, <laughs> you know, it's all anyone can talk about. So it's like, what can we do there? You know, are there things that we can do in blog posts? Do we need to create a video? Do we need to, um, you know, understand what our products can do around AI? Do we need to just talk about it more in general, have an event around it? So um, together, the developer network, all these different teams can kind of come together and say, hey, together, we can tell a more compelling story with these different types of content and understand what people need from us. So for instance, like, 
when you're writing a blog post, it, it is more about that like point in time, interesting thing that you're trying to capture. Whereas docs are more like evergreen. You're like trying to tell the complete story of how you use the product, all of the use cases, all of those things. And you're hoping that it stays relevant and current and accurate forever, which is not always the case. But but the blog posts really are those point in time things. Videos are a little bit like that as well. Um, so it is just understanding, I guess, um, what story you're trying to tell in that moment and then figuring out the best medium to tell it in, the thing that will be most engaging to people. That's awesome. Um, so uh, I, I'd love to dig in a little bit more into this idea of like uh, creating a pipeline and generative tools for docs, right? So Jen, you kind of alluded to the fact that you all are rolling out a platform. Lorna and Andrew, I know that you both work at companies that build these you know, kinds of platforms. It feels like an interesting challenge to me to design a meta docs tool, right? To like really look at it, not from the perspective of how do I make Twilio's docs the best, but what are the best practices for docs, period? Um, you know, what are the, the design principles there, right? Like what are the things that are important, you know, regardless of what platform or API might be using these platforms? I can start. So one big thing that uh, Jen mentioned that resonates with me is this migration uh, from CMSs into Docs code. We've heard from uh, many prospects and customers that there's always this tension between uh, maintaining Docs in a Git repository versus maintaining it in a CMS like WordPress. And oftentimes we hear um, folks who use a CMS sometimes regret that decision later because it made it easy to write docs, but you know, writing docs as a point in time uh, snapshot of your product uh, means that that information is going to be outdated within an hour. Um, oftentimes, uh, your engineering team is moving very quickly, and uh, sometimes, like having to maintain a platform where uh, engineers have to log into a portal and figure out how to maintain information and keep things up to date. Um, it's like a whole uh, other part of the job description that I think engineers don't often uh, consider as like one of the, the top priorities, but it can be a really uh, big issue and it can be a, it should be a top priority for uh, companies that want to uh, deliver um, a high quality experience for your, your customers, especially if you're an API company. So. I think the other side, flip side of the coin is if you migrate everything into a code first uh, uh, mentality, such as um, maintaining all your docs in a code repo, uh, you immediately um, make it hard for PMs and technical writers to help contribute uh, because it is a pretty large, not uninsurmountable, but pretty large learning curve for people who don't spend all their time in Git. Um, so there really needs to be a middle ground between the two to really create that collaborative atmosphere between engineers and technical writers. I'd like to draw on a couple of those threads because there's a bunch of really interesting conversation going here. Everybody's mentioned docs as code. Yes. If you're not doing it that way, what are you doing? I think if you need to ship any volume of documentation with any accuracy at any kind of speed, like why Git is the best collaboration tool around why would you do that differently? I've been giving quite a lot of talks in the documentarian space to try to unlock the author experience for them. I think we underestimate the sheer repertoire of skills that the average tech writer has. A lot of them are much more technical than you would ever imagine. And they do all kinds of things with access to the internet and docs, if you leave them unsupervised, they can handle the most arcane, ridiculous workarounds in these enterprise CMS tools. Like Git and GitHub is nothing <laughs> in comparison to that. And I really feel that as developers, we have a responsibility not just to build the best tools for ourselves, but to then play that development or authoring experience forward. It should be easy to create. You should have a choice of tools. You know, there are very good GUIs and integrations for Git. Also, it's really not that hard, although do recommend that you don't allow your engineers to teach Git to your writers. Many good writer-oriented Git resources exist. 
And it, and it's, you know, we, Jen and I both spoke about the importance of knowing your audience. This has gone wrong for me a bunch of times. And when it's gone right, it's because we've given that audience the information they need and the, and the use cases that they need to succeed. And not everything an engineer thinks you need to know, um, because I disagree. It's like a funny like tie back to the whole idea of having engineers write docs in the first place. Is like engineers, I, I think I, I've observed similar to you that like engineers uh, often have trouble distilling down information into the requisite pieces, uh, and that can result in like a fire hose that's difficult to digest. Yeah, turns out technical communication is a skill. Um, I'm, I'm trying to like direct the hose with templates and things, but uh, even the most enthusiastic developer can be too much. So I think the author creation is really important. Markdown also, tech writers are incredibly smart. It's not that hard. Um, there are lots of GUI tools. There are lots of great web editors. Uh, we are overstating the difficulty of this, but we could support them more for sure. And I think that's a really big thing. So that's like one whole thing. I'm going to park it, but maybe we need to untangle some of those threads again. Um, in terms of how to make that easier. I don't think you shut out technical stakeholders, but you do need good tooling. So you do need immediate previews. You do need, those need to be public. You need to be able to just put a page in front of somebody. And that's important. The other topic that I wanted to pick up was, um, I work a lot with Open API. That's, that's my background. Um, I'm on the Open API steering committee. I live and breathe this stuff. Um, and I find it very interesting for us to talk about that as generative something that you only make from code. Because alongside the docs as code movement, I'm seeing very much the design first movement where you absolutely don't generate from code because then you produce an open API description, whether that destination is for docs or for SDKs or for something else, which is only as good as the information that you can maintain in your code base. Or we, we might be generating from an open API, but I don't, I think it's a false assumption that you always want to generate the open API. Sometimes you want to write the open API, make sure, get everyone on board, make sure it's up to standard and then have it implemented and passed downstream to the other tools. So that's something that, yes, there are some docs, maybe config settings or something that you can rip out of a code base, but for the most part, that's not always the best way. Interesting. So, so what you're saying, just so I, I make sure I understand here, is that like a best practice you're seeing is that people design the API sort of like product and user experience as its own thing, and then ensure that the code actually accomplishes that, rather than simply taking a huge code base and generating an API spec off of it. Yeah, and it works really well for changes as well because. The open API is a contract. You can easily generate docs from it. So even just here's the open API, here are the docs. Let's get everyone around the table. Everyone can participate in this from using the open API source. You can also, I like to spin up a mock server because that's how my brain works. Sometimes I just need to curl a thing to reason about it. Um, everybody can do the thing that works for them. And then we've got the contract. Everybody knows exactly what's happened what the change will look like, how the error messages will be. You don't, you're not asking an engineer to make a sign-up endpoint and just hoping that she does it right. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, we've got the details nailed. We can run the linting, get the consistency there. And hopefully the back end does exactly what you expect. You can generate bits of it or the front end client and the docs will be ready to go. I'm also a big advocate of letting the um, technical writers in the room the design time, because <laughs> Open API has like you ne you have to name things really well, and they have little like short summary fields. This micro copy it's a it's an art, and if you can get your communicators in the room, we build the right thing. We know what it's for. <laughs> we talk about it correctly. The error messages make sense, and so the design that's why the design first APIs um, are gaining so much mind share. I'm not sure it's the easiest way to build an API, but it might be the overall least effort, honestly. I would love to build off of uh, what Lorna has mentioned here about design first or API spec first uh, development, which is a tenant that um, at Palantir um, and my colleagues who've worked at AWS is a widespread um, practice. 
And it typically is widespread in big organizations where those organizations have uh, uh, invested in these tools internally and have kind of gotten everyone used to this culture of designing specs before they built something. So when I left Palantir, I was actually quite shocked that in the real world, there's not so much of that culture and it's um, and there's not a lot of uh, good tools out there that make this easy. And so um, what we've I've seen with a lot of customers is um, the, the direction of generating open API specs from servers, as Lauren had mentioned. And that's oftentimes harder than going the opposite direction, which is designing your spec and generating server code and generating docs and generating SDKs and all of the different things from one central uh, design spec. And so uh, one of the reasons why Fern was created was to take some of those like learnings from both AWS and at Palantir, where perhaps we we uh, believe that OpenAPI isn't the best spec for uh, representing an API spec, or maybe that's not true, but rather it's hard to design an API from OpenAPI, even though it's a very good spec because everyone uses it. So I think some of the tools that need to be worked on in the future, um, and Fern is trying uh, to do some of that as well, is build better tools for developers to uh, write specs very efficiently and make that a core part of your organization's culture. So it doesn't matter how you get there. Uh, it just matters that you have the right tools to start thinking from a design perspective and not just start writing code immediately. If you're inspired by what you're hearing and want to get more involved, consider partnering with us at Major League Hacking. Major League Hacking is the largest community of early career developers in the world. We help leading DevRel teams connect with our community of over 150,000 developers each year to learn about their technology platforms and bring them with them into the industry. To explore opportunities for collaboration, visit sponsor.mlh.io. We can help bring you to hacker community events like hackathons, meetups, workshops, conferences, and even open source contributor and training programs. There are plenty of avenues for you to make an impact. Don't miss out on the chance to shape the future of developer education. I feel like this is like a core uh, uh, character trait of engineering organizations, which is that for any given job you want to accomplish, there's uh, perhaps an infinite number of tools to get to your desired end state. Like I'm thinking of like no JS web frameworks, you know, like, like how many are there? I don't know. There's a new one every day, but it's interesting to hear that there's kind of like differing perspectives and approaches that are popping up out here. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm curious, like, like, before we move on, if you have anything to add to that, Lorna. I just want to really echo that it doesn't matter how you get there. Like if you're currently in a state where your API is, open API description is generated from the bits of string and chewing gum that are sort of behind the curtain, like that's real life. And if you have systems that work for your business, then uh, who am I to tell you that you're doing it wrong? Clearly you're doing it right. Um, so I just think like, that's a really important thing. And I'm seeing more and more people who are generating code and then doing more of a transform step and looking at how can we enrich this, you know, adding extra information at, to enhance the output of the SDKs by giving them a bit more context or publishing just some endpoints, hiding some private or experimental ones into the docs and seeing a lot more API transformation. And there's things going on in the open API space like the overlays um, initiative, which lets you, yeah, update the descriptions and add and remove things between we generated this thing, I'm just gonna massage it a bit. Okay, and now we can move on. So I think, you know, Andrew just said that we have more tools to build a hundred percent and I'm excited about it. So I, I want to uh, take the conversation in a slightly different direction from here. Uh, one thing we haven't touched on yet is how you actually evaluate the quality of your docs and perhaps the ROI for the business, right? And, and I think we can all agree that having docs is sort of the bare minimum of being a developer platform. Like if developers are using your tool, they need some documentation. 
But how do you actually quantify, are these docs good? Are they accomplishing the business goals that we've set out? You know, what what factors in to that sort of like look back on, on where things are at? And I'd love to start with you, Jen, because I feel like it sounds like you've been through a pretty iterative process, like actually like improving and building the docs at Twilio. This is something I think I've struggled with my entire career. Um, it's just, it, it's an impossible question. Um, and I... Uh, I've gone through a lot of different iterations at different companies about how you measure ROI, what you're trying to look at. And uh, yeah, when I started here at Twilio, we went on this like fact finding mission. We went out to all these companies, um, like all the like top docs companies that you could think of. And we were like, what do you do? What metrics do you look at? You know, like, how are you measuring ROI? And no one had great answers. They were kind of like, I don't know, what do you do? So it was, it was really interesting to hear, like, this is not something that's solved. If, uh, there's somebody listening who thinks this is a good idea to solve this. I would love to invest in your product. But I think the, the short answer here is a little bit like it depends on what organization your team is in, um, what metrics they're reporting up, and you have to kind of align to those. So for instance, right now, my team is in the marketing org, which means that we are aligning to marketing um, metrics. So it's it's about like, how many signups are we getting through documentation? That's one of those things. Like how long until somebody makes their first API call? Um, how long till they spend this amount of money? So it's like trying to understand where do the docs come into play? Like when were they last touched um, in that, that kind of customer journey? There's a lot of things you can look at. You can look at like traffic and bounce rates and all these like Google Analytics types of things as well. But those don't really tell you anything because um, sometimes you want people to stay on the page and sometimes you want them to leave. And it's just kind of hard to know um, what like you're interpreting within the data. Um, we have a, a feedback mechanism um, on all of our pages, a thumbs up, thumbs down, as well as comments. That actually tells us nothing as well because people aren't rating the docs page. They're rating the experience they're having in the product at that moment. So you get a lot of like, thumbs down on like parts of the product that are confusing or that they're mad about. We get comments all the time where people are just mad. We had a flood of comments a couple of weeks ago. We couldn't figure out why um, people were really, really mad at us. And it turns out um, they had sent out an email about something and inadvertently included a link to a docs page as the unsubscribe link instead. So everyone's like, we can't unsubscribe from here. What are you doing? Well, that makes it look like our docs are bad because if we're kind of compiling those ratings, uh, everybody was slums downing that page. So um, I will say there is someone on my team who's our, our product manager now and our platform experience team, Wade Christensen, who came up with um, what I think is probably the best shot at this, which is like a docs metric framework that we're starting to work from that really calculates the health of particular areas of the documentation. So it's saying like, is this part of the docs healthy? And that includes things like quality and accessibility and and lots of different things we can look for. So different characteristics within there, and then we can apply different um, different metrics to those characteristics, but it's a work in progress. We'll see if it works. Uh, but again, it kind of goes back to what your part of the organization is, is looking for. It feels like a, a simple thing, like docs are necessary. Um, they're important. People should invest in them. But the answer there is just not straightforward. I mean, I feel like I've put together enough IKEA furniture where it's like, obviously I need instructions, but there's a high variance between good and bad instructions. Yeah. And there, there's a lot of things that we can point to, but it, it's pretty subjective, honestly. You know, you really need like user research to understand like, are these docs working? But that's very point in time as well. You know, and it's just just around a little area of the docs. Like at Twilio, the, the docs my team is responsible for, we have about 5,000 pages. How are we going to measure the effectiveness of all of those? Um, it's it's just a hard question to answer. And I think, you know, Jen, Jen is so right. Like there there are, there are no good answers. Uh, and I've done it from the point of view of DevRel, which is the same thing. I was like, there's no really good answers. I enjoyed seeing, you know, how many signups we have that convert that had seen docs, like how those two things play together. But it's very, very difficult um, to really measure measure the value and i think a lot of companies just don't realize that they could do a lot more with their documentation and crucially their users could do a lot more you know we're we're all building developer enablement tooling this is literally what we do 
and we want them to go and be even more awesome, even though they're already quite awesome. Um, and, and like, did that happen? Oh, you just don't ever really know. Yeah. And I just want to say too, it's, it's really interesting to me because again, it's like, it feels like such a, an obvious thing, especially when you're, your product is for developers um, and you have to use the documentation to use the product. Like, why would you not invest in the documentation? But um, I don't think companies see that a lot of times. They think like, oh, it's it's working. People, there, there's documentation. But if you give, you know, a technical writing team, a developer education team, just a little bit more, a little bit more resources, like think of what they could do. Like just the fact that we've been talking about developer tooling, and yet I have worked on so few documentation teams that have dedicated engineering teams to support those tooling requests. Like there's something broken <laughs> in the industry. And and it's frustrating because, you know, I remember, I keep going back to this. I don't know why. I'm sure there's a more updated survey I could reference. But the 2017 GitHub open source survey um, talked about the most important thing for developers was documentation. And yet, what are we doing as an industry when we don't really have enough folks who understand what it takes to create documentation? They're not invested in it. They're not thinking about it from the, the holistic view of a company who's supporting documentation. Everyone agrees it's important, but no one wants to actually work on it. And the, the ones who do, the, the folks in this room who care about it, who understand how important it is, um, we just need like a little bit more, a little bit more funding, a little more resources, a little more like care, I think, from, from the rest of the folks in tech to actually make a difference here. So that's me getting on a soapbox here, but yeah. It's always interesting to take things that from one perspective are a need to have and put them in the context of a business that is, you know, at certain levels, very disconnected from that need. Right. And, and I think that that happens all the time, whether it's DevRel or Docs or many other uh, things in, in this world. Um, well, one of the things you touched on, Jen, that I'd love to hear a little bit more about, uh, you know, also from the other panelists is feedback and sort of like, um, uh, qualitative like reactions from developers, like user testing, uh, seeing people interact with your docs. Uh, I'd love to to hear about like any examples you have where watching someone go through your docs led to a significant change, or getting a particular feedback led to a you know big change. And I think I want to go beyond like you know there was a typo or or something like that, right? Like what actually changed your perspective on how developers were interacting with your docs? Um, I can give a, a fairly recent example. Um, we had a lot of changes uh, to our compliance product in the last year based off of carriers. So not things we wanted to do, things we had to do. Um, and it was confusing and people were mad about it. And a lot of that is, is on the product. You know, it's not things that we can fix. You know, documentation can't fix product things at the end of the day. Um, but we heard heard the frustration from developers. And it, it was very much like, okay, it's going to take this amount of time from the product team um, on their roadmap to fix some of this, these things. So what can we do in the documentation? Like, how can we make things clearer or easier? So um, we actually brought a, a contractor in um, through a company that we work with, Stack Builders, who is great. If you ever need any engineering resources, they're wonderful. Um, but we brought in a contractor just to focus on this type of our documentation for about six months to clean up everything that they could. Um, their contract has ended. And so now our team is focusing on it a little bit more to clean it up according to like additional standards. So it is really just making sure that if we hear that there's an area of the product that folks are having problems with, we look at the documentation and say like, what can we do here? Um, you know, at the end of the day, one of the other things I, I forgot to mention, but just like ticket deflection to support, you know, that's one of the big things we want to try to do. So if you see like support is getting slammed with some area, um, you know, you want to try to clean up the docs as much as possible. Um, there's other things too that I've done in the past. Like we used to at GitHub, um, there were these things called patchworks. I don't know if anyone ever went to any of those. They were like super fun little events where you would get people together um, just for a couple hours and you'd walk them through like getting started with GitHub. And so my team was doing an offsite one time and we ran a patchwork and we had everybody like kind of come in um, and we took that as an opportunity just for all of us to say, like, how are people getting started with GitHub? What are they running into? What questions do they have? So, like, very unofficial user research, but seemed like, you know, good time to do it. And I think that more than, like, I guess, triggering some kind of big change in the docs, I think that for us just gave us a little bit more empathy. So 
to your point earlier, Andrew, about like tech writers, like having problems with GitHub, like we had all been working in it for so long that it seems super easy, but seeing, you know, from the point of view of someone who had never touched it, who didn't know anything about Git, had never looked at GitHub, it gave us a, a renewed sense of like, okay, we're, we're doing this for a reason. We are trying to make things easier. It, it kind of reminded us of why you create documentation in the first place. So that was just a, a nice moment, I think, for our team. You know, what you were saying, Jen, is very reflective of my experience in MLH's community. Like when I go to our hackathons, we're typically working with college students. So they're relatively early in their careers. And, you know, like as the MLH rep, I get asked to debug all sorts of different random things. And watching someone who like has never seen one of these platforms before go through it for the first time is this like incredibly enlightening experience. Like a lot of people, you know, in our community, like it's their first time using GitHub. It's their first time using Stack Overflow. It's their first time using an API. And it really like gives you perspective of what we take for granted when we're de designing developer platforms, like what we think everyone knows already. Okay. And, you know, whether someone's a student or whether they're a really experienced developer, there's always gaps in knowledge that we don't predict. And so I think that like the type of thing you're talking about, like patchworks or even going to like meetups or hackathons or whatever else and watching people interact with a product is just like this incredibly valuable experience that can't really be replicated through automated, you know, tools. Yeah. Some of my staff were at Write the Docs last week and they had, they do a writing day. It's like a hackathon, but for writers. And they came back with such a big list of things. It was just great. And I feel like they had that. They created those light bulb moments for people who hopefully will go on and contribute more open source documentation themselves someday. I think the only thing I, I, I could add to this is that I think it's a very difficult problem to quantify the impact that docs can have on a business. And um, as Jen has alluded to, sometimes it's not really worthwhile to spend too much time trying to quantify it and spend more time trying to uh, spend that one-on-one -on -one time with your customers and getting feedback. I think uh, every like design oriented company knows that getting to spend as much time as possible collecting feedback from uh, your customers is invaluable because you develop that empathy, you understand how they use your product, why they want to use your product. And we spend a lot of time developing that for the, the customers of a product, but not so much on the documentation part. So that's a big gap that I think uh, every company can spend a little bit extra resources into. So, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about feedback and sort of like how you evolve documentation over time. Well, one thing I'd like to sort of like touch on here is evolution in docs as a format, right? Like I remember back when I was starting out as a developer, docs were very... Um, uninteractive, I guess is the best way to describe them. Like it was literally text on a page. Uh, and Andrew, I know you started off by talking about how you're building like Stripe-like docs, right? And, and when I think of Stripe docs, I think highly interactive, right? Highly sort of like adaptive to what you're trying to do. I'd love to hear from each of you, like what are the trends right now in modern docs like what differentiates someone who's building docs in a 2024 way versus a 2010 way i think this is a super interesting question and my personal preference is like the 2010 way <laughs> um because i just think sometimes you know i've worked in devrel i've been a twitch streamer i'm a video course author and mm, the written word has great power um, I have some accessibility needs myself. So whatever your cool interactive thing is, I probably can't use it. So if you haven't written it down as well, then I can't actually use your product either. So locking me out of the docs is not really great. But the docs also can be put through text-to-speech, can be made bigger, can be translated, can be studied in a way that's appropriate for everybody, um, and can crucially the machines can read them. So that's becoming increasingly important as we get a little bit more, you know, the large language models are reading our languages. Like having it written down is really, really important. So that's my preference, but I'm from a like quite an old school open source kind of, you know, I'm a Linux user, whatever. Um, and I think the trends sh do and should 
look different depending on your target audience. Um, you know, I'm currently working at Redocly. Our target audience is somewhere between a uh, full-time documentarian practitioner and there are some engineers, um, but they are more application developers probably. Whereas in my previous role, um, I worked for Ivan, who are an open source database as a service company. Our audience is really, really experienced as admins, right? So they have different documentation preferences. And I think it's really important that we don't, as a documentation platform provider, that we don't make assumptions, that we don't give so much interactivity that our users are making terrible experiences. Um, and we kind of give the tools, but not anything more. So that might be controversial, <laughs> but I really wish your docs were less interactive um, and they didn't bump around when I was trying to read them, but that's how I feel about it. So so are man pages like the pr platonic ideal of docs? Yeah, I mean, I don't think man pages are all that useful because they, <laughs> they're just like a list of commands, right? And we create too much content like that. Uh, we create too much, here is, a, here is a reference page, have fun. You know, a lot of the time, you go to a README and it shows you how to install the thing, but there's no suggestion of what it actually does. You know, what 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 problems does it solve? Under which criteria would I choose or not choose this tool? We never say what it is, what it's for, what it does. Um, that's always missing. I don't have to install it. And when I made the transition from full-time engineer into developer advocate, it meant that I work in, I mean, like you said it about being at hackathons, you debug what's in front of you. So you instantly become a polyglot pro programmer by necessity. I'm a really experienced developer, but there were some dependency managers that I wasn't familiar with yet. And that makes you a beginner and people make assumptions. So that's a, definitely a tangent, but um, I think we, we need to structure the information well. Who is the audience? What do they know? What do they need to know? Why are they here? You know, what would a typical, what content type is this? But does it need to be interactive or not? That can depend a bit, and it can depend a bit on your corporate voice as well. Like Twilio is very fun and has ridiculous interactive things that wouldn't work for another company. So it's very much about finding something that works for you and for your the majority of your audience. I feel like you're in my brain a little bit with this answer. That was like exactly what I was going to say as well. I. I'm always like a little embarrassed to admit, but I don't really pay attention to a lot of like the big documentation trends because they never feel relevant to my work in that moment. Because to Lorna's point, it is about understanding like what your particular users need. So if I'm going to like throw something on the doc site that's just cool just for the sake of it being, you know, a trendy, fun, interesting new thing, but it doesn't actually serve a purpose and makes it harder for people to digest the information and, and use it. I would be doing a disservice to our users. So for me, it's really about getting the basics right. And that's what we're focusing on right now is just like fundamental. So again, like we're moving to a new platform. We are thinking through how to make our, our content less product-based, more use case-based. These are the types of things that help people. Um, and so I, I think it is a little bit about moving away from this idea of, of trying to to keep up with all of the latest trends and really just focusing on, on what people need from us, from our documentation. That being said, there's definitely some stuff <laughs> that, like we have to keep up with. So again, going back to like all the AI things, um, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have some folks on my team who are able to keep up with that at the rate at which things are changing, which I am not. Um, so really looking through like, what can we do within our platform? Like an obvious example would be, um, you know, because some of the search things that folks are doing, just um, like our search right now on our site, we know is not good. Do we need to bring an assistant in to help us with these things? Um, maybe. We'll see. Um, we're also just thinking more about like um, more like using AI within our platform. So not even user facing things, but what can we do within our platform to make things a little bit easier for people creating the content? Like that's that's really more where we're focused on some of these like trends within documentation is understanding kind of behind the scenes, what can we make faster, easier, more scalable? Because at the end of the day, users aren't going to care if my team is only five people. What they care is if they have the information they need. So what can I do with less? So that's really where we're focusing our time um, is, is understanding that and really investing in our platform. I feel like that's a great segue to really the last big topic I wanted us to cover, which is 
AI, right? Like, obviously, it's the hot thing of the moment. You know, all three of you have touched on it in different ways. You know, how do you approach this sort of like, perhaps very hyped up, but also arguably very useful technology that's coming down the pipe? I actually relate to both Laura and Jen's perspective more than I relate to the Stripe uh, way of building docs, even though I have said that uh, we're inspired by Stripe in a lot of ways. But when I use Stripe, when I go through their docs, I also skip all the interactivity portions. And that's definitely not something that we prioritize building either. Just it's a lot of visual clutter. And I do respect that there's um, multiple modes of learning and that uh, different people have different preferences. And uh, reading is one of them. But as Lorna said, uh, it is one of the most versatile format. So investing in that first and foremost is very important. And I'm an avid reader, so I read a lot and I pay attention to having a uh, good t typography and having text within a certain width of the page. And these uh, details that really matter to a reader, because I think we've all like, experienced opening a man page on terminal. And it's like this block of text and there's no way anyone can um, like dive into that uh, without putting a lot of like mental energy towards it. When it comes to AI, I think I take a somewhat similar uh, approach here, which is you probably don't need AI in your docs, um, especially not user-facing AI. Um, I think one of the hardest challenges in information technology in the last century is uh, information retrieval and figuring out how, like, how and when to uh, surface information that's most relevant to the person looking for that information. And AI could be helpful there, uh, but we've also seen AI in practice not being quite helpful. I try to use a GPT on a daily to like for, be the first place where I search for information. And it's 50% of the way there in terms of finding the right information for you. Um, and incorporating that into your docs might actually be counterproductive today until uh, we have a better like technology behind surfacing documentation, um, maybe a more refined or fine-tuned model that is specialized in documentation, something like that, uh, that needs to come down the line before it's really valuable to users. I mean, I don't think even open APIs docs have a chat bot on them at the moment, which is maybe the case in point of what you're describing there. Uh, Jen or Lorna, do either of you have strong opinions about how AI is perhaps going to change the, the practice of documentation or content? Maybe I'm naive, but I actually don't think it's going to change a lot of things. So like when Lorna was talking about like um, context, like that's something that cannot be generated um, by itself. You know, someone has to create that context. Someone has to write it. Somebody has to you know, be working with product managers and engineers to say, this is what this thing is, and this is why you'd use it and how you use it. And then maybe, you know, then like, yeah, I can come in and say like, oh, now I'm going to, you know, pull the information from many different places and spit something out that's even better. But I think at the end of the day, um, people still need to be able to create the content, to create the context and, and it may look different. Like we're thinking about like, what does the future of documentation look like? Will that be a, a, a doc site like we have right now? I don't know. Maybe there will be a doc site plus something else. Maybe it'll be more um, in product uh, documentation that's in there. And that to me is more like getting back to the, the tooling and the platform, like being able to support pulling your content into many places. Um, but those are not necessarily related to AI. Um, for me, it's it's really about like how can I automate um, the the things within our tooling or within our, our processes right now that we don't need to do in the future and figuring that out. Um, but from like a front end kind of user facing point of view, I don't think there's going to be a lot of changes in the next few years at least um, that folks will will see AI making a big difference within formal documentation. I guess to to push back on that a little bit before we go further, like. Aren't we in kind of a situation now where we're in the AI large language model, whether we like it or not, like whether or not it's a incorporated part of your docs or content, people are going to chat GPT and asking it questions about how to use Twilio. So how do you deal with that sort of like reality, even if it's not changing the, the core discipline itself? 
So we're looking into that. I don't have a good answer for it right now, but understanding like what do we need to do differently within our documentation? Are there things within like our metadata that we need to provide so it picks it up easier? Do we need to think differently about how we have, you know, some of our docs that we write kind of thing? Um, but I don't think there will be a lot of big changes that we need to make necessarily. I think actually going back, it might be more like, how can we still get attribution? <laughs> so when we're talking about metrics and stuff, like, oh no, now no, like they're not going to our site sometimes. We're not going to see that last touch. What do we need to do differently to understand like if the docs are useful? And that part is actually scarier to me than anything else because all of those metrics, that relates right back up to like funding. Um, so it does make me a little nervous for like docs industry as a whole to understand like, you know, we're already having a hard time telling the story of the value of documentation. Will that get harder in the future because people aren't coming to the doc sites as much as they were? So I think that to me is is the scarier part um, and understanding how we can kind of work against that a little bit or still get some of those those clicks. Yeah, I definitely would echo that. I think um, the assistants have a lot to offer us. The stuff they're really good at is pattern matching, right? So they can do, here are five bullet points. Write it me in the form of an academic essay. This is going to be a talk. I want it as an abstract. Please write this as a blog post. Make it more marketing. Make it less marketing. Make my talk sound friendly. Make me sound professional. Hey, I'm British. It turns down the superlatives. Try that. I'm British. Turns down the superlatives. Amazing. And that's very, very subtle. So in terms of enabling non-expert writers to turn out correct content presented in the expected style, there's value there. Um, you know, I'm currently publishing templates, but maybe we would just train something to be like, no, we don't do it like that. We do it like this. Like, you need to say what it is before you launch into it. This is a terrible explanation. Try again. So there, there are like individual writing level things, but like Jen, I think that good docs are good docs and i think we have a new audience and that audience is going to misuse the content but we need to be quite careful about how we write for it but even more careful about where we get our own information you know we will return to was this human written like organic food or like <laughs> was it does it have preservatives in like <laughs> was it written by a person do you know the person do you trust them i think that's going to become more of a problem because you know it can write our docs for us yeah of course it can and some of some people will go that route and we'll be able to spot their docs they sound plausible but they're not actually going to get you to the task that you need so i think there are risks there are risks that people like oh my nephew says chat gpt can do it so i fired my docs team um and then we lose the expertise in the industry so there's a lot of risks here. I think things might change, but maybe less than the hype train would have you believe. Uh, that's a great note to end on. And I, I will keep an eye out at my uh, local like Brooklyn farmer's market for artisanal docks in the near future, um, you know, handmade and all that. But uh, thank you all so much for, for being on this panel. Uh, Jen, Lorna, Andrew, a lot of really fantastic uh, discussion and best practices here for everyone listening. Um, if you enjoyed it, definitely subscribe for more in the future. But uh, thanks, everyone, and uh, happy hacking. Thank you for joining the State of Developer Education for our latest expert panel. If today's discussion sparked new ideas or interest in how to reach developer communities and teach them about your platform, we encourage you to visit sponsor.mlh.io to learn more about how you can engage with this vibrant, high-impact community of developers. Remember to subscribe to our channels for updates on future panels and episodes, as well as industry events like DevRelCon. On behalf of Major League Hacking, I'm John Gottfried. We look forward to seeing you at our next panel.